So, yeah. we, we plot before the intensity of cases, and we obtain this pattern, you know, in our previous practice, you see? And it seems that the, the, the cases tends to be here. This map shows the intensity of controls. You see that it's much more homogeneous, the distribution of, of controls, you know? So obviously, already, just from the description of our point pattern, it's obvious that there is an area where, apparently, there is more cases that we would expect. What we are going to do with the k-functions is to determine whether these differences are real and statistically significant. So here in this first part of the practice, what I do is to transform the uh, coordinates of cases and controls and the polygon in kilometers, because before they were in meters, you know, and for plotting the distances, it's easier to have the kilometers. So here in this vector, what I'm doing is to calculate the distance that will be considered for the calculation of the k function. You see, I have choose just uh, half kilometer here, 0 0.5 kilometers, at, in an arbitrary way, you know, because this is a fake example, and the, 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 the clustering of the cases is so intense that just looking at distance up to 0 point, uh, kilometers shows obviously that there is a lot of clustering, okay? So here, what I do is to create a vector that contains different distance where we are going to calculate the k function. So the s vector, the x object, contains distance. So it contains 100 values for the distance where we are going to calculate the k function. So the k function is going to be calculated for each of these distance. And the maximum distance that I selected is half kilometer. So to calculate the k function, there is already a command in R that calculates this k function, that is this uh, k hat command. Hmm? You need to specify the object that you want to use to calculate the k function, the polygon that you want to use to calculate the k function, and the vector of distance that you want to use to calculate the k function. Okay? So I repeat. This k function, to, to, expect, to calculate the k function, you need to provide the coordinates, hmm, that are the coordinates of our cases, the polygon, where the cases are located, and the set of distance where you want to calculate the k function. Usually, we calculate k functions up to half of the size of the polygon, hmm, as a maximum. Here, I use just the first uh, 500 meters, just for uh, practical reasons. So, what I'm going to plot here is the, as we have discussed in the theory, no. this is the expected k function for our homoge homogeneous Poisson process. It's p multiplied by the, dis the square distance, hmm? this part. So, in the x axis, I'm going to put the distance, and in the y axis, I'm going to put the theoretical k function for a homogeneous Poisson process. Is that correct? Hmm? Do you remember that? The yeah, do you remember that we arrived to this point where in an homogeneous Poisson process, the expected k function is known and is p multiplied by the square uh, distance. Okay? So what I'm, I'm doing here is just to plot the theoretical k function for different distances. So this is what we have observed previously. Eh? This is the theoretical k function up to one, up to uh, half kilometer. Hmm? What's the type equals one? What's that doing in there? What? Type equals one. Pi square type equals one. 
is L, is a line, that I want a line. Because otherwise it plot dots by default. So now we are going to add, as a line, the observed k function in our, uh, of our cases. So this is the theoretical theoretical k function for a homogeneous Poisson process, and this is the observed k function in our point pattern of our cases. Hmm? So you see that for distance that go from zero to half kilometer, starting from 100 meters, our observed pattern tends the, the points tend to be closer uh, to another. The density of the intensity of cases is higher that would you expect considering a homogeneous Poisson process. Hmm? Is clear? From addition of O1 to O5. Yeah. Okay. No okay. We could calculate this up to one kilometer, eh? If we, if we want. It's not a... Uh, uh, is the when, when the graph is above the nice line, then it means that there is more clustering than expected. When there is above, yeah. it's more clustering than expected. Okay. When it's uh, below, below. Is that it's more dispersed. More dispersed than, than random. Than random, okay. exactly. Okay. So you see, we can calculate it up to uh, one kilometer. But for a practical reason, I took half mm -hmm. kilometer, eh, because otherwise it's a distance of the much. So we come back to our distribution of the cases, and what we can do is to, using the Monte Carlo simulation, to calculate with the same number of cases, 100 homogeneous Poisson uh, distributions, and plot where are the 95% uh, percentiles. Hmm? It's done here. So this key envelope calculates the envelopes for the k-function, okay? like the expected confidence intervals. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So this is a Monte Carlo simulation where we run uh, 100 point patterns that are completely random in the space. And we take the k-functions for the 95 per percentiles. Hmm? And you see that in all the simulations that we run, they were inside these two envelopes. Mm -hmm. If we consider a, um, a homogeneous Poisson process as our theoretical distribution. Okay? Now, we can see the statistical sorry, difference, but we don't know which is Here, the there is, yeah, what is telling us this graph is that there is overall, there is clustering. In our distribution of cases. But we don't know the, the, how much the p value. We, we will calculate it, okay. eh? but I have not included uh, this here <coughs> in another two files. So if you want the p value, I can send you, I can add it to the practicals and I could post it in the web page. So here, but I mean, for, for me it's very important the graphical, I mean, it's the same information. Eh? Here it's obvious that the point pattern exceeds what you expect. Uh, under a random uh, uh, homogeneous Poisson process. And, and it just knows to do 95% confidence intervals because you didn't tell us anything. Yes. Yeah. It's by default, it calculates 95% of the intervals. And it's using this command. No. no. Hmm? It's using this command. So you specify the number of points that you want, the polygon, and the number of uh, simulations and the distance. And it can run. Uh, a random Poisson process and it calculates the k function for each one. It stores this information and it plots the 95% confidence interval. So, and, uh, just a quick note it might lie inside the bounds as well because I, I, I ran it a couple of times and mm. the simulations then made it. So, you made, the a, brackets. you made a very good point, Florian, that the simulations, 100, cannot, can be not enough. Uh, for a Monte Carlo test. Usually, we should go to 1,000 simulations, something like this. 
you know. So if you launch 1,000, let's plot it again. One thousand simulation with different uh, distance. One thousand simulations. One one thousand simulations hmm? for each distance. For each distance. So you see, <laughs> you have a different view yeah. of your data. So usually, what should be done is to test that the parameters are stable enough. Mm -hmm. So, okay, let's say that 1,000 is not enough. Oh. Let's put 10,000, okay? That's what we will put in another color. It takes like 10 seconds, so. So the steel, mm -hmm. steel. Usually there is there are tests to check that your change, what normally is done in Monte Carlo simulation, is not to use just one simulation, but multiple simulation at the same time, and obtain convergence for the estimate. So one to obtain confidence intervals that are really stable. Okay. The thing is that well, the issue that we have here is. Is not of happen, uh, often doesn't happen because we have more cases. The problem here is that we have only 16 cases, so it's very a small number. So to get a stable uh, estimates is very difficult. Usually we have more cases. You know, we have we have like 300 uh, cases or so. So if you run the usually with 1,000 simulations, is more is more than enough to produce an a stable estimate. Yeah? That's 100. Yes. Does the p-value take into account how many simulations you run? Uh, it, yeah, for the, if you want to calculate an overhead p-value, yes, because it's, uh, the, the p-value in the Monte Carlo test is not calculated using a theoretical distribution, it's using the percentiles. So by default, you are going to take into account the 2% values and the 2% values that exceed the expected. So by default, the simulations are included in the calculation of the... But you need to report how many simulations you have done in order to interpret a Monte Carlo p-value. But basically. isn't it that the less simulation you run, the more in variation you have? Unstable. Yeah. So but, but, here, but here the, the uh, boundaries get bigger and bigger the more iterations you run. Oh. Yeah. yeah. That's to me counterintuitive. Because the yeah, no, but you, usually... When, when you report a Monte Carlo uh, p-value, you need to inform about the number of simulations that you have done. And there is some rules that determine the minimum number of simulations that should be done. In principle, this shouldn't be done like based on a theoretical value. You should test for convergence. So there is a point where the confidence intervals do not change. I will show you that now, if you have 300 points, the convergence is obtained even with 1,000. Frank, could you describe what you're seeing? Okay, one, one second, and then you show this issue about the simulation. Okay. You see that here, if we have enough number of cases, like 300, that sometimes, I mean, we, we should often, I mean, the problem is that we are trying to make inference with only 16 cases which is quite, uh, uh, I don't know, brave, <laughs> at least. So usually we have a higher number of cases. So this, the, the both blue lines show the confidence intervals with 100 simulation and with 1,000 simulation. So you see that the convergence is obtained. So it's, it's very stable when you have enough number of cases. The problem in our example is that you have very small number of cases, and there is huge variation. So probably we would need to go to 10,000 or even more simulation to get a stable confidence intervals, and to run different chains. So if you want to do something powerful, but at some point with 16 cases, probably you need to recognize that you cannot say anything. 
Okay. But sometimes it's impossible to have more cases. For example, if you don't have more cases, <laughs> you cannot conclude. This is a, and most, I think that this is very important but when we are, really we are interpreting the test of hypothesis. Is that when you reject the null hypothesis, that, that when you don't reject the null hypothesis, you don't say that the null hypothesis is true. Yeah. Is that you are not able to reject this possibility. So basically, if you don't have power enough to reject the null hypothesis, you are not going to be able to reject the null hypothesis. But it doesn't mean that the null hypothesis is true. Yeah. It could be not true, but the only thing is that you don't have enough observations to reject this possibility. So can I just confirm with you what's showing here then? We've got a thin line which is the expected k function based on there being uh, homogeneity yep. mm -hmm. and the confidence intervals around that expected yep. estimate. And then you've got the observed dependent upon many times you've simulated it. Um, this is the observed one and the other ones are the confidence, and the confidence intervals around those based on Monte Carlo simulations. Oh yeah, the differing number. Mm. And what we're seeing is that the matter in each circumstance they include the expected line based on homogeneity. In this two cases, yeah. In, in these two cases, yes, yeah, because we have only 16 observations. You know? okay. So, so it's if, if we do enough simulations, we cannot conclude whether our pattern differ from a homogeneous Poisson process or do not differ from a homogeneous Poisson process. Because the green, uh, they are the interval of confidence, but for uh, more simulations. For more simulations. More simulations. Which is the point that Dirk was saying. What, what Florian is, is highlighting is that with 16 cases, our estimates are not very stable. Yeah. So you need to run a lot, a, a huge number of simulations if you want to make a stable your uh, confidence intervals. But even with 16 cases uh, in the region that they occur, that is quite uh, large, probably we are not going to have. It could be that we don't get convergence. So we, we need to assume that probably this method cannot be, uh, cannot be applied. Okay? But let, let's now consider the other approach. Eh? So because we have plot just, just the k function of the cases. Eh? Yeah. But is the same for the controls or not? Eh? It was my random brain. Uh, <laughs> it was really random. <laughs> so it, it was a really random selection, you see? Because the control that Thomas selected were really close to the expected uh, uh, Poisson process. And the, I mean, always this line is going to be within the confidence intervals. As I said before, it, it could be interesting to calculate the difference between the k functions of cases and controls and to set up the null hypothesis that both are equal. Okay? So here, what we do is we take this k function for the cases and this k function of the controls and we calculate the difference between them. So this object contains the difference in the k function for cases and controls. Now, uh, well, this is the, how it looks like. So you see that goes over zero and to make uh, over, over zero, clearly. So if I set up you see, all the difference are over zero. But are these statistically significant, this difference, or not? So we are going to follow a very similar approach and um, the uh, Secal uh, command calculate uh, the standard error in the difference of the k functions. Okay. Now we are going to plot the difference in the k functions and the 95% of the intervals. Okay. So this Secal command Calculate the standard error of the difference in the in the k functions using a, a random labeling. But it's a parametric estimation. 
So from a parametrical point of view, we could say that the, diff, the, the both the cases and controls, the k functions, differ of these controls that uh, uh, Thomas selected, hmm? and this exceed the confidence, the the, the ninety percent confidence intervals. So if we consider the information coming from the cases and the controls, we are able to set up a statistical difference <coughs> in the distribution of the cases and the controls. So you see that. When we combine both information, we, get, we gain power. We increase our sample size, and we can uh, determine a real difference. So, okay, this can be first outcome of our analysis that uh, determine that our distribution is more clustered than what we would expect if we control by the usual density of population in our uh, study region. Hmm? In that case, you say like uh, this cluster above a distance of 100 meters? Or exactly. Here, what we would say, there is clustering for distance higher than 150 meters. Hmm? And what happens if after um, they yeah. cause that somehow the difference? You would say like... You, you need to calculate a p, an overall p value. You want to so you would like Separate you would say like it's cluster between like 200 and 500 and then that cluster... It, sometimes it, it go down again and you have a range where the function exceeds mm. a certain distance where the function shows that there is a statistical difference between the distribution of the cases and the controls. Mm. Usually we observe this when we are, when we are considering a small distance. Mm. The clustering occurs usually at a small distance. Often, when you have you consider large distance, the k function came back in the 95% envelopes. But you can calculate an overall p value for the whole uh, uh, function. So, okay, well, this is the well how the k functions can be used to detect clustering in the distribution of our cases. So. You see that we can follow two steps. The first one, it will be to compare the observed k function with the homogeneous Poisson process, hmm? the gate function for an homogeneous Poisson process hmm? with lambda, with cost and lambda. In a second stage, we could compare the gate functions of cases and the gate functions of controls. Okay? This will define whether our set of points tend to be clustered or not. And this second step will inform about whether the clustering is, is really coming from another source than the usual density of population. Okay. It's more or less clear for everybody. Okay, Uli. <laughs> there are questions. Could you just repeat that? Yeah. So, in a first step, what we do usually is to compare our distribution, the spatial pattern that we observe for both cases and controls with a completely uh, random, homogeneous uh, Poisson process. Okay? This is going to tell us whether this point pattern is clustered or is not clustered. And we have discussed before that most of the epidemiological uh, uh, studies, in most of the epidemiological studies, we will observe clustering in the distribution of cases just because the people tend to live together. So in a second step, we want to compare the distribution of the cases and the distribution of the controls to check whether the clustering is just due to the fact of the density of population or whether this is due to a second source of clustering, for instance, a point source. Or, or, yeah. So, just as a summary, just comparing the observed k-function of the cases 
with a, a completely random pattern, it's not enough to say that the clustering that we observe can be linked with something else. You need to compare with a representative sample of controls. If you, um, if you calculate the k function for the controls, you must have sampled controls before. Is the, um, in, in, in more conventional statistics, you would take controls and take their value and you don't start to sample. If you do a normal case control study, you don't... But you already sample when you do a case control study. Yeah, I know. You, you, you select controls. your controls and you take it face value as your best estimate and then you have a... Um, and you calculate confidence intervals, but you're not doing Monte Carlo for the but controls. You, you could do. Yeah, you could do. The question is, do you have a formula for uh, the appropriate amount of controls? Because otherwise I think, okay, I take 10 and then I run 10,000 simulations. So there must be a trade-off of selecting it, controls. It's, 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 it's very similar that what we observed before. There is like a, when, when you go for more than four controls per case, you are not gaining a lot of power. It's, this, it's very similar that in the current case control studies. But you usually you are going to take uh, two, three, four controls for each case. And you could, for conventional case control studies, also use tests that are similar, that, that, that employ Monte Carlo simulations for the controls to see the variation in the control. In the pressure, of course, that you could, you could uh, a regression that is not based in a parametric estimate, but using a Monte Carlo simulation. It's you can do logistic regression, use Monte Carlo. I mean, it's not, uh, what is the small s again, please, in the brackets, ks? Or what does the s stand for? The s is the k function for a specific distance, s. The ah, s is the distance. Okay. Okay, so, so far, the only thing that we have answered is that there is clustering, and this clustering is more than what we would expect considering the normal population distribution. In, a, in, in, in your uh, practical, you have uh, an option, optional practice, where we are going to identify the clusters in the space. Okay? Not only to say in a general way that there is clustering, but we will localize the clusters in the space. So you have the, you have the function there to do so, uh, I mean, I'm going to, la to, to launch the code and we will discuss a little bit the outcome and we finish here the, the practice. Hmm? So the principle is that you remember that we have calculated the density of uh, cases and the density of the intensity of cases and the intensity of controls uh, before. You remember that this was the first outcome that we obtained from in our analysis. You see? Here we have the intensity of phases and here we have the intensity of controls. It is possible to transform this kernel estimates in a incidence incidence of events. So if we divide this number of events per unit by the total number of events, it could be like a Incidence, real incidence of event in our in our data. We can calculate the risk ratio between these two, and you have the code here to calculate this risk ratio in the kernel of cases and in the kernel of control. Okay. So it's this code. So basically, this is the risk ratio of the two kernels, the kernels of the cases and the kernels of the control. We are more used to interpret this type of outcome. You know? So this line is the log risk ratio of having cases versus having controls. Okay? So the exponential of the log risk ratio will be the real risk ratio. Okay? You see that the risk is much higher here. Hmm? 
So those values that are minus is that the risk is lower than one, and for those values that are over zero, the risk is higher than one. It's a bit confusing to me is because the red for me is something is really yeah because the, the, the scale uh, by the, the default scale in R is hit the the, here is hit yeah. you know so the the more yellow or the more white is the higher risk mm -hmm. in this area in this in this map is the default it's color default scheme okay. it's possible yeah. to change it no yeah. no it's just that uh, from it's the possible to change it so can you explain it again yeah Sorry, so yeah. this. What I have done is taking the kernel of the cases and the kernel of controls. I have divided and I have, I have obtained a, the, the expected intensity of cases and the expected intensity of control. Let me move to the formula. So the kernel of cases then is the expected number of cases eh, per unit and the kernel kernel of controls is the expected number of controls in order to, to transform this in a kind of incidence, we need to divide the kernel of cases by the total number of cases and the kernel of controls by the total number of controls. In this case, we have the expected number of cases divided by the total number of cases. It's like an incidence. Number of cases divided by the population, number of cases divided by the population. Kind of. If you divide these two values, you obtain a resolution. So this map shows the risk of finding cases if you compare with the natural distribution of the population. But it's not by population, but by the area. It's, it's adjusted by the controls. You know? And you represent this in a, in a map. Okay. So here, the risk of finding cases is higher than here. Or here, the risk of finding cases is lower than here. This is our actual map? Or yeah, it's, it's the map that we were using yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it the ratio of cases in two controls is higher in the right area? Yeah, it's a kind of it's risk ratio. It's, indeed, it's a risk ratio because you obtain the expected number of cases and you divide by the total number of cases that you have. Oh, yes, you're right. Can, can, can we do this in the case control study? Exactly. You, this is the recommended method in a case control study. Although it's, it's not, they are not odd, odd ratios, they are risk ratios. So it's like if you run a binary regression model for an odd ratio, for a case control study instead of a logistic regression model. It's the same uh, type of approach. Which is correct. Are these attack rates? Hmm? Are these attack rates, incident rates? Yeah, it can be, uh, it can be like uh, uh, interpret uh, the, the incident risk ratios of cases versus control. So it's an approximation to the incident risk ratio. So there is as well a Monte Carlo methods to change the labels of cases and controls and to do simulations, you know? What it would be, so basically, let me plot here the points of the cases and the controls. So this is the actual uh, distribution of the cases in, in black and the controls in green, okay? This is what we have observed. But we could remove these labels and we could start random labeling the cases and the controls. So instead of, <coughs> so I remove the color and I will start applying one color randomly for each dot. Hmm? In this way, we will obtain like a, a distribution, that, an expected distribution of cases and controls if under the null hypothesis of no clustering. Hmm? Did you get more or less this sense? that if you remove the labels and you start 
providing the label of case and controls in a random way, the null hypothesis will be this is the usual distribution that I would expect if there is no clustering. We can do this several times, like 1,000, 10,000, and we can obtain confidence intervals for this clustering that we have observed, for this area that looks like cluster. Okay. You see? So I have run my uh, here 1,000 or 100 simulations, we can now run 1,000 to see the effect, or how stable are our estimates, okay? But here, this uh, bold line is telling me that in this area, there is more cases that would you expect under the random labeling uh, method, you know? So here, the, na the number of cases that we have is higher than what we, we would expect if we start providing random labels to cases and controls. So this is quite useful to identify where the clusters are located. Okay. It's a method that is widely used to locate the clusters in the space. And this is called random labeling. Mm -hmm. random and the labeling. one on the contour line, Sorry? 0.5, you see the figure on that contour line. Is this is one for the actual. This is one. This is the log risk ratio. Yeah, okay. So it's a risk ratio of two. You know, if the log log risk ratio log risk ratio is equal to one, then the risk ratio is two point seventy. Yeah. Whatever. It's the exponential. Okay. And here, this number is the ninety five percent. This zero point. 975, so the upper limit. Mm -hmm. And this is the 0 0.025, is the lower limit. Mm -hmm. So this area ha have lower risk, significantly lower risk, and this area has significantly higher risk. So we are able to identify where the cluster occurs in our population. So I can run more simulations. Instead of 100, I can run 1,000 to check whether my um, estimate is stable. Mm -hmm. You see, and I obtain exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So now this estimate is really stable. You see that for the other confident interval, the lower? Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, no, it is it's not. Here is the now, the cluster that he has identified. So I, I, I would need to run this several times to check convergence, okay? So still the sample is very small, it's 16 cases and 30 controls, so probably it's not enough to, to detect uh, uh, clearly the cluster. We will need to, to run much more number of simulations. This is just an example for, for the practice to understand the, the concepts. But uh, you see that there is steps that are not so uh, easy and cannot be explained in four hours. This is the and the random labeling um, leaves the dots where they are. It does not change their position. Exactly. It just changes the, the label, the label. Whether it's a case or a control. Exactly. exactly. Let's yeah. Yeah, you see that? So we we'll need really to, to make sure that our results converge. Because here, the sample size is quite small, and we have a problem of convergence. So if we run only 100 simul simulations, we obtain this cluster. <coughs> if we run more simulations, we, uh, we, we start dealing with problems of convergence. So this is a, a further step that we are not going to discuss here, but it's very important. This is solved using different chains for the analysis. So you launch the same analysis several times and you get something that converge at the end and you consider that this is stable, stable enough. But this illustrates the problem of the Monte Carlo method. You know, if you just run a small number of simulations and you trust these results, it's a problem. You need to be sure that your data really converge. So, well, there is other nice tools in in uh, R, when you have your um, 
your cluster identified, you can, well, here is. Uh, So you can have a 3D perspective of your cluster when when this is uh, when this is identified. You know that can be well it's somehow nice to to present. But the the important thing is that you understand a little bit the methods that we are using, not only to detect clustering that it will be the k function, but as well this method of random labeling that allows that allows to uh, localize the clusters in the space. Okay. Okay, so this will be the, be the, the <laughs> message. So I don't know if it, you got some, at least, concepts from spatial epidemiology analysis. And uh, it's just a very brief introduction to this type of analysis because there is many issues that we were not able to discuss in four hours. For the kernel, we should, con I mean, there should be a specific discussion about the selection of the bandwidth. Mm -hmm. Here, uh, for the Monte Carlo test, we should discuss the methods to uh, achieve convergency in the, in the estimates. And, uh, um, you know, there is, in addition to this, these are just univariate analysis, so it's possible to run this type of analysis in a multivariate way, accounting for other confounders like age, sex, the presence of other uh, spatial uh, events. So the complexity is quite, quite high. I wanted just you to have a very uh, brief introduce to these concepts that probably are for most of you not new. And I'm sorry for the time because I wanted to say many things. <laughs> so I feel a bit frustrated. The last part of the exercise, the, the, the last part of the exercise in the practice four is uh, is how to calculate or how to um, analyze um, area data. Okay, so you will, it's, it's quite straightforward because the only thing that uh, the only thing that it does is to. So, what is done in the in the last practice? This is the same map of the incidents that we we obtained yesterday from the Christosporidium cases in in uh, South India. Okay, you remember that there were. Uh, some regions with higher incidence of cases. Okay, this one, this one, this one, this one. So what I explained in this last practice is a method to calculate the incidence risk ratios. So this is this, these are not in incidents; they are incidence risk ratios plots, and a method to calculate the confidence intervals for the risk ratio. So this graph shows the risk ratio of the different uh, local authorities and the three ones that were with significantly higher risk of uh, crystal okay. So it's just some, some introduction to the analysis of the aggregated data. This is again only a crude analysis without adjusting by age and sex. And on top of that, we can add a smoothing to this, which is... Uh, something else. Um, Do you think that in one of the startup and not shape files will be compatible as well? Let's say first in version 13 or something, Sorry? that you can lo load shape files in a startup? Apparently, yes, the new version. Uh, you can uh, 
Yeah, use shape files and do ma mapping, but no spatial analysis, it's just mapping. Mm -hmm. Just uh, and that's the, uh, in such yes, as well, I think that you can, there is a spatial analysis modules. But, I mean, the advantage of R is that everything on spatial epidemiology is really developed first in R. So, if you want to become a, an expert on this, or, or at least a middle user on spatial epidemiology, the tools that you have available in R are really broad and well as well, very well uh, documented, you know? So do you have books? I should send you some reference if you want to read a little bit more about this. There's a couple of book papers that describe all what I have explained here. And uh, there is as well exercise in the libraries that you can follow in addition. I think that for the next case study, uh, we will change the, 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 the example to make it more clear when something is significantly different and <laughs> because it was a fake outbreak, you know? So we will try to use a real outbreak where... Uh, yeah. Bravo. I have a bag of treasures that you have to take something. Oh, it's an iTunes voucher! Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. My, 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 my blue bag of treasure. Yes!